Afternoon all. I just wanted to welcome you to the fourth armchair travel talk. Um, I'm just letting the last 100 and so people that are currently waiting in the waiting room to come in. Um, we've had a great response so far. We've So far there's 730 of us sat here listening. So it's been a great uh, response to the talk so far. We've just got 30 more people to go and then I'll begin. Just the last few coming in now, 13 to go. <laughs> So I just want to say uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, as some of you know from previous talks, I'm Claire Baxter, the alumni, traveling, the alumni engagement coordinator who runs the travel program here in Cambridge. And my colleague, Kate Suarez, who is hiding in the background this afternoon, who is the alumni travel manager at Oxford. If anyone has any general questions regarding the program, please use the chat function below and either Kate or myself will get back in contact with you. This afternoon's talk, we welcome Nirvana Ramel, who, would like, who I'd like to thank for giving up a little of her time this evening to talk to us. I would also like to talk, I'd also like to welcome Daniel Moore from Distant Horizons, who is hosting the event for us this evening. Daniel is one of our longest standing travel operators, um, and we are very thankful for him uh, for all the tours that he's put on for us recently. Um, some of you may remember or traveled on the Silk Road tour or the St. Petersburg tour. Um, and on that note, I'd like to hand over to Daniel. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, as Claire mentioned, my name's Daniel Moore. <clears throat> I help manage the cultural tour company, Distant Horizons. Uh, we specialize in scholar accompanied journeys to most parts of Asia, um, the Middle East, North Africa, and to Europe. Uh, we try and focus generally on the sort of lesser visited destinations in those regions. Um, for the last 20 years now, it seems a very long time, we've been helping Oxford and Cambridge alumni organize journeys. And I think in that time, <clears throat> we've organized nearly 300 trips uh, for the alumni. Uh, so we've got reasonably experienced in it. Um, and we've had a wonderful response to, to this lecture. Um, and it, in particular, what's lovely to see is a lot of faces and people that have traveled with us before. Um, and so a big hello to them and also a big hello to people who haven't traveled with us. Um, I mean, while I'm on the subject of the lecture today, which will be given by Nirvana Ramel, I wonder if I can just mention a couple of housekeeping uh, suggestions. Uh, we've got quite a few people who've tuned in today, so it would be great if you want to ask a question. I think the only way you realistically can ask a question is, is via your chat box. Um, so that would be great. And hopefully at the end of the lecture, we'll have some time to answer those questions. Um, just before uh, Nirvana starts, I wonder if you might permit me just a quick plug of the Oxford and Cambridge Alumni Travel Programme, or at least the journeys that Distant Horizons is organising over the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, we have a journey to Bhutan, accompanied by Zara Fleming. And this is based on several walks at fairly low altitude in the Himalayas, so that that party can experience and visit some more remote and uh, fascinating sites. It also takes in a couple of festivals, which are very lively and colorful affairs in Bhutan. Um, and for many Bhutanese is a high point of the Bhutanese, of their calendar, their cultural calendar. We also have a trip to Japan, uh, which is accompanied by Professor Jay Lewis of Oxford University, and perhaps nearer home, we also have a, a journey into the heart of Central Asia. Uh, this will visit many of the sort of major and fabled cities of Central Asia, like Bukhara, Samarkand, uh, Kiva and Merv, which for many contain some of the major and most spectacular art and architecture in the Islamic world. Incidentally, it's accompanied by Professor Charles Melville, who actually accompanied the very first Distant Horizons Oxford and Cambridge journey to Iran back in 1999. 
uh, nearer home. We have a journey to uh, Romania accompanied by Dr. Alex Collar, and this will involve six or seven uh, days of fairly light walking in, in, the, in the stunningly beautiful Carpathian Mountains of Transylvania and Moldavia in Northeast Romania, uh, perhaps one of Europe's last remaining great wildernesses. Um, as well as being stunningly beautiful, it's also an area of, of incredible, fascinating cultures. Uh, and perhaps most relevant today is a journey to the Central Balkans, uh, to the newly formed country of the Republic of North Macedonia, and also taking in Albania, or so Southeast Albania, and that will be accompanied by Nirvana Ramel, who's going to talk to us today. Um, this is still an area dense with old world cultures, uh, ancient villages, medieval monasteries, mountain ranges, and actually some of the deepest lakes in Europe. Uh, and this is probably a good opportunity just to introduce Nirvana, um, who has, it was a born and bred Dalmatian and was in, in the Balkans in the, in the troubled times of the 90s. Uh, she's been accompanying trips for Distant Horizons to the region ever since 2007, both for Distant Horizons and for Oxford and Cambridge Universities. Um, and I, I, I think you, will, you can't be in more capable hands when it comes to understanding the history of the Balkans, whether it's intellectually, culturally, artistically. Um, and if you've got a couple of questions about food and wine, I think Nirvana could answer those too. Uh, but anyway, I think over to Nirvana now for a, a brief canter through the history of the Balkans. Thank you. Hello. When I started working on this talk, uh, I wondered how far in history I had to go back. Then I remembered a conversation I had four years ago while sharing a coffee with the Kosovo academic in Prizren, a pretty little town in Kosovo. We were discussing uh, the Serbian and Kosovo feud that was completely paralyzing the whole region, still is, despite the fact that the war was over for over a decade and Kosovo has been was at that point independent for nearly a decade. I, I didn't and I still don't have much love lost for the Serbs, uh, but I do believe that we all need to move on. And I tried to argue that their whole national, religious, um, political identity was born and forged in Kosovo. And that had to be taken into consideration no matter what. He looked at me and uh, replied that Kosovars had nothing to do with it, with that colossal historical mistakes. Sh Serbs, as far as they were concerned, uh, should have never been in Kosovo in the first place. So I said, but it wasn't their idea. The, the Byzantines gave it to them. And uh, he looked at me and he said, but it wasn't Byzantine to give away. For him, that unfortunate uh, decision of some seventh century Byzantine government official uh, felt as fresh as that morning BBC news might feel for you. And uh, even more than the BBC news, perhaps, uh, it affects the way that that whole region has lived for more than a millennium and has died uh, as well. And again, it still does. So in today's talk, we do need to go back in history uh, if I am to show how the past still resonates uh, in the region's present. To make this heavily abridged history, as clear as possible, I have constructed it around major European historical divisions. Because in almost every great European feud, physical or ideological borders were drawn right across these wonderful troubled lands, and the locals were forced to choose side or balance somehow in between. That is why I refer to the Balkans population as the peoples of the gap, mind the gap. You can count the main local or foreign players in British history on two hands, but to count them for the Balkans, you need at least two pairs of hands, uh, at least 20 fingers. So this should give you an indication of how intricate the storyline will be today. So let me introduce you to the peoples of the Gap and the other key players uh, in this long and very messy history.
Illyrians were the original uh, people of the Balkans. We do not know much about them. Their archaeology is hidden below the Roman and the Greek one, and they served no purpose in creation of any great Slavic myths. So they weren't researched very well. Uh, it is suspected that Albanians might be direct descendants of the Illyrians, but this is a hotly debated topic. I'm staying away from it. Then uh, there are Southern Slavs who arrived in the late sixth century. Serbs, uh, Croats and Slovenes uh, were recorded by Byzantines and Franks, but it is most likely that today's Montenegrin and Slavic Macedonians developed as separate offshoots of those tribes. But this is yet another hotly debated topic. And then uh, we have Bulgarians who are today considered Southern Slavs, but are a historical product of a melting pot uh, of semi-nomadic Bulgars from Central Asia, indigenous Trachians and Slavs. Uh, the outsiders were numerous, but I will concentrate on those who left the lasting impact like the Byzantines, Franks and Ottomans and leave the also runs for some other time. Everything about the Balkans seems confusing. Even the geographers can't agree on where the peninsula ends in the northeast and northwest. So, you know, does it end as it's shown here with the river Sava or perhaps the river Drava uh, on the border with Hungary? Or should Carpathian Mountains be included and therefore Romania as well? Uh, again, hotly debated topic. Uh, but wherever these borders are, never mind them, uh, just keep in mind these mountains because this is how more than 90% of the Balkans look like and this has been a very important factor in its history. It's not easy to form allegiance or even maintain feuds uh, when you need to cross something like this to get to your friend or foe. Even as we speak, there are places in the mountains of Bosnia and Kosovo, Albania, Montenegro and North Macedonia that still don't have a permanent reliable connection with the outside world because of the terrain and climate. So don't worry about remembering finer details, uh, just uh, uh, keep these mountains as a sort of mental backdrop to the story as I go on. A lot of people relate to this area as a historical territory of Yugoslavia, which was a federation of six republics with various Slavic people and uh, two autonomous provinces, uh, Vojvodina with the Hungarian majority and Kosovo with Albanian majority. Notice these borders, um, especially these ones of Bosnia, because Bosnia is really at the very heart of it all. And we will be seeing these borders throughout this uh, talk. They are mostly natural borders of uh, mountains, averaging nearly 5,000 feet in height, um, and powerful rivers, often cutting through steep canyons, like uh, this one, Tara River Canyon, on the border of uh, Montenegro and uh, Bosnia and Serbia, right here. The disintegration of Yugoslavia in the 1990s was seen as yet another perfect example of balkanization. Now, this term which means to divide a region into small and mutually hostile groups, was coined in the late 19th um, and early 20th century when the Balkan section of the Ottoman and Habsburg empires were morphing into independent nations. However, if we step back from the 20th century politics and take a good look at a much longer sweep of history, we can see that the process of Balkanization started already with the Romans in the third century and is still really going quite strong, unfortunately. Uh, the Romans conquered in the indigenous Illyr Illyrians I mentioned earlier, uh, some 150, years ago before Christ, uh, and by all accounts, they quickly assimilate into the Roman Empire, the Illyrians. There are so many wonderful Roman sites across the Balkans, not just some small outposts, but cities, often wealthy municipiums um, uh, under the direct uh, rule of the uh, city of Rome, like Stobi here in the North Macedonia. Places with great arenas, such as this one in Pula in Croatia, or imperial palaces uh, like Gamzigrad in Serbia, built uh, by Galerius, or the Diocletian's uh, retirement pad in today's Split in Croatia. But 
the Balkans were crucial for the military and trade logistics of the empire and Romans wasted no time in building roads uh, here shown in wonderfully simplified version um, perhaps not with fully accurate road names though but um, we, we're after a big picture here so notice how uh, Romans managed only two main transversal routes uh, this one and that one that this one goes through Bosnia and uh, this one goes through uh, Serbia and Kosovo and uh, Macedonia and down to Thessaloniki and uh, even they couldn't really conquer those mountains and it is along one of these transversal routes the Bosnian one that the empire was first divided into the western and eastern creating the first official split the first gap in the Balkans this was more of a bureaucratic uh, division making taxes payable either to the west or to the east but it was a harbinger of things to come um, and a metaphorical foundation of the invisible cultural border between the European east and west and it went straight through Bosnia Troubles truly started in the 6th century with the arrival of Avars, a multi-ethnic nomadic group of Huns, Turks and Mongolians, and then also Bulgars and Slavs into the Balkans. They fought each other as this uh, great terracotta plaque from the early 7th century shows. The horseman on the left is marked as Bulgar and the one on the right, it's almost the... Uh, um, all lost but there is an indication here of the Sklavigi. Um, sometimes they would gang up together and attack the Byzantines who were already weakened by the wars with the Persians. Eventually sometimes before the mid 7th century the Byzantine Empire entered into an agreement with Serbs who were at that time living in the area of today's Thessaloniki. They were offered land for settlement where they could form a defense zone against the Avars. The Serbs proved an excellent border control, which allowed the Byzantines to focus on other areas and, for example, halt uh, the Islamic expansion into Europe and uh, also put up the last fight in the north uh, Italy. It seemed all good for the Byzantine Empire, but it was not very good for the Balkans because the land which was offered for Serbian settlement was Kosovo. East of the old uh, Roman borders which I have uh, artistically drawn here in red and that decision of effectively a foreign power of the Byzantines in the 7th century was the beginning of this serb kosovo feud which is still very much unresolved as I mentioned in my introduction. So uh, looking at the millennium or so older map of the same area, here's that east-west uh, border, you can see here Kosovo marked as the Serbian principality. Um, as they slowly formed their own states, it seemed that the Slavs had two options, either to become the vassals of the Byzantine or the newly established Bulgarian Empire in the east, or the Frankish Empire with Pope's blessing on the west. Many played with all sides at different times. The 8th and the 9th centuries were crucial in reinforcing that early east-west gap uh, introducing, uh, introduced by the unsuspecting Romans. But also, <clears throat> while the Pope and the Franks worked more or less in unison, Byzantium was getting uh, progressively weaker, almost constantly warring with the Bulgarian Empire, who was a formidable opponent. So the push and pull wasn't quite equal. The Byzantine-Bulgarian struggle took around 330 years, and uh, this vibrant elimination from the 14th century Manassas Chronicles, I love this, uh, uh, this chase here, shows the 11th century conclusion in uh, Byzantine favor and the death of the Bulgarian emperor here. But for the most part of those three centuries, it was Bulgarians who were winning. Although the Bulgarians had the power, the Byzantines st still held on to their prestige because they were still referred to as Romans and nurtured this idea, this uh, PR of being the only direct line uh, of succession to the Roman Empire. They also had centuries of experience of diplomacy and bureaucracy 
and a resplendent capital, which was also the seat of the ecumenical patriarchal uh, Church of Constantinople under the protection of the imperial court, unlike the Pope, who at that point was surrounded by unfriendly Lombards and Goths in Italy and really fearing for uh, his future. But this situation changed radically when one Pope helped the Carolingian accession to the Frankish throne. The Franks then conquered most of Italy doubled the size of the papal state with land donations, enraging the Byzantines who thought of all land in Italy as theirs. And then in return, the Pope crowned Charlemagne not just as the King of Franks and Lombards, but also the Holy Roman Emperor, thus causing mass apoplexy in Constantinople and a new serious East and West gap number two. These two main European powers fought, sometimes literally, sometimes through diplomacy, for the overall supremacy over the Balkans territory and peoples, because this is where the gap was really, you know, bordered. While the locals just tried to get on with their own agenda, namely forming some sort of national states on each side of that gap. Slovenes were very early on swallowed up into the Frankish Empire and uh, only emerged again in the 20th century. Croat duchies uh, fought amongst themselves, uh, which means one was supported by Byzantine and the other by Frankish rulers, and uh, then eventually united into a kingdom, uh, and, uh, more leaning towards Franks and uh, definitely leaning towards the Pope. The Serbs were organized in a principality and uh, fighting Bulgarians and Byzantines, uh, while uh, Bulgarians were more or less an, on equal terms with the Byzantium in terms of, of might and power. Macedonian territory was swallowed by a succession of powers, first Bulgarian, then Byzantine, uh, short, for short period Serbian, and then Ottoman for a very long time and only emerged as, a, as an independent entity in Tito's Yugoslavia. Albanians were either holding their own high up in the mountains or answering to the same powers as Macedonians. Um, a lot depended at which altitude you lived in, in those times. The mountains were very much a, the defining feature in Albanian history. But it wasn't a straightforward division. Uh, sometimes Serbs and Croats got together to ask Byzantines uh, for protection, like in this particular instance, uh, they asked uh, uh, together to be protected from the Saracens down on the coast, and they were plundering the coast coming from Sicily. Um, and then sometimes there were internal divisions, as I mentioned earlier, between Croatian duchies and so on. Um, so but the Bulgarians always uh, held to their own. It was a very messy period, but crucial in defining the East-West gap and forging national identities. The adoption of Christianity did not smooth the rift. The saintly brothers Cyril and Methodius were engaged by the Byzantine emperor and the patriarch of Constantinople to evangelize the Slavs. Before setting off to spread the word among the Slavs, Cyril and Methodius first standardized the literary and liturgical language, now known as the Old Church Slavonic, which is still used in the Slavic Orthodox churches. They were from Thessaloniki, where a large colony of Serbs still lived at the time, and some say that they might have been of Serbian origin, but that is yet another hot potato I'm not going to handle here. So for the first time, Slavs had uh, their written language and even their script, because while Charlemagne's scholars were busy standardizing classical Latin language and script and Latin liturgy in the West, Cyril and Methodius devised the language and then the Glagolitic script, which is a forerunner of today's Cyrillic, translated the Bible and religious text into Old Church Slavonic and established Slavic liturgy. The Slavs were very happy with Slavic liturgy. The, the Christianization went relatively smoothly um, and it, the Slavic liturgy also got the approval from the Pope. 
However, the next pope in line uh, prohibited Slavic liturgy in 873, pushing for the standardized Latin mass, which was very much an official Carolingian policy. And this became a point of contention among Slavs. This sculpture shows a Croatian bishop, Gregory of Nin, as he passionately advocated the use of Slavic liturgy at the church council in 1925. Officially, he lost the battle, but in practice, there were very few priests who actually knew Latin, so the Mass continued to be said in the Croatian version of the Old Church Slavonic. Not wanting to rock the boat so close to this east-west gap, Vatican did not formally ban the use of Slavic liturgy in Croatia until the Second Vatican Council in 1963. So we were the only Catholics in Europe enjoying this special dispensation, thanks to our delicate geopolitical location. The push and pull of the East and West uh, manifested itself in the architecture of the times as well. This was Gregory's Cathedral, the Church of the Holy Cross in Nin, built in the 9th century and uh, nicknamed the smallest cathedral in the world. It is really tiny. Its plan is Byzantine, a Greek cross with a dome. <coughs> Sorry, its uh, building tradition is Roman, as the <coughs> orientation and openings are organized in such a way that they track the movements of uh, daylight throughout well, the day and the year, so that the whole building can serve as a clock and calendar. Only 10 miles down the coast from Nîmes um, is this uh, grand church of St. Donatus, built also at the same time, early 9th century. Donatus was a lo local bishop and a Croatian diplomat who led the representatives of the Dalmatian cities, both to Constantinople and to meet Charlemagne. <coughs> <coughs> it is clear that Charlemagne impressed him more because upon his return from the Western mission, Donatus instigated the building of this church, uh, which with its simplicity bears resemblance to Charlemagne's Palatine Chapel in Aachen, which uh, you can see now, and not to the complex buttressed Byzantine structures such as Hagia Sophia or even um, San Vitale in Ravenna. In the East, there was even more stylistic confusion in the East and West, West mix. And um, for example, this is one of the earliest Serbian churches in the Bishopric of Ras. And uh, if you look, the left side of it is quite Byzantine with a central plan. And then the right side of it is very much like the um, Latin Roman Basilica. So both of them merge together because they seem like they couldn't decide. This is very much a true of a Serbs. They couldn't decide for quite a long uh, while. So when the third big gap occurs in Europe with the Great Schism of 1054, the Balkan people are already neck deep in it. That gap runs more or less alongside the old Roman division border, but it remains very fluid until the Serbs finally pick orthodoxy in the 13th century. In a move of an utter diplomatic genius, they got their first king anointed by the Pope in 1217, and then two years later, his brother appointed as the Archbishop of the Autonomous Serbian Orthodox Church by the Patriarch of Constantinople. At that time, the only other Orthodox Church that was granted autonomy was a Bulgarian Church, for obvious reason, the Bulgarians paid in blood. But no <coughs> other nation in Europe managed to play the main opposing powers in such a way and gain official recognition from both camps. This also tells you the lengths to which these powers were prepared to go to maintain their influence. Moving on into the late Middle Ages, uh, this was a mixed bag of prosperity and loss. Croatian Kingdom did not fare very well in that period. It was forced to accept the Union and the King of Hungary as its rulers. And its coast was then sold to the Venetians in 1420. This created a significant gap number four 
a cultural one between the Mediterranean uh, Venetian culture and what will soon become a Habsburg culture of the Central Europe in the north. Croatia is still the country of, of two cultures. The capital of Zagreb in the north is nicknamed the Little Vienna and the south is a melting pot of ancient Greek and Roman and Venetian and Italian, Ottoman and Slavic cultures. I mean, <clears throat> we drink a lot of espresso, but we don't do it like Italians, you know, standing at the bar. We do it like the Ottomans. We sit down and take two hours and a lot of discussion amongst friends to, you know, kill one little espresso. <clears throat> Dubrovnik uh, Republic emerged as a beacon of Croatian hope in, in those times, maintaining its independence with the diplomacy and the magnificent, magnificent fortification for 450 years. Um, until Napoleon tricked them into surrender and uh, now the uh, cruise ships also uh, conquered them. I know that the Brits have a love affair with Venice, but there's no love lost between the Croats and Venetians. They cut our forests and the winds blew away the soil. That's why our coastal mountains and islands are so barren today. And Venice is still supported by Croatian oaks and beech trees. They imposed draconian laws and taxes on Slavic population and for 400 years they actively discouraged road building because they didn't want us to get united. They built only what they needed, what you can see here, city gates, uh, courthouses and fortifications, all emblazoned with the winged lion of Saint Mark. When my daughter was small, she believed that we could go on a safari into the forest and spot live uh, winged lions as, because she saw so many in stone as we traveled up and down the coast. Elsewhere, it was a different story because the light, late Middle Ages were good for the places with rich mineral deposits like Bosnia and Serbia. In a Serb rule, Kosovo, thanks to incredibly rich silver mines, the Serbs were dominating in the East over Byzantines and Bulgarians, finally, and they were building lavish churches and monasteries covered in amazing frescoes, and not just there, but also uh, in Constantinople and on the holy mountain of Athos in Greece. Along the East-West Gap, uh, gold and silver mines were abundant, and Bosnian duchy grew into a kingdom um, in the 14th century, but thanks to the mountains, managed to maintain distance from the main powers, even uh, developing its own Christian Bosnian church that was considered heretical by both the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox hierarchies. These mysterious monuments uh, considered to be related to the Bosnian church can be found uh, in remote places where they escaped eradication by the official churches, uh, but they can still be found all over Bosnia and uh, on the on the borders with the other nations. This is a typical medieval gap town called uh, Pochetel on the river Neretva. It started off on the old Roman route that uh, divided the East and the West Empire. You can still see it uh, here now with asphalt. It got uh, its mighty fortifications. Uh, it goes all around and here's the corner of it. Um, from the Bosnian king in the late Middle Ages, as it was always important stop on the caravan route uh, through which the salt and wine uh, of Dubrovnik were traded into the north and the Bosnian gold and silver were transported uh, down to the Adriatic posts for export. But then the Ottomans arrived, uh, maintained the trade route, of course, and uh, added their buildings. Uh, you can see the mosque, obviously, here with the minaret, but all of this, this is a, a very much a proverbial Muslim architecture down here. But uh, also another thing that the Ottomans changed is that Pochetel was no longer a Bosnian town. It was now officially in Herzegovina. Uh, which is the name that the new Turkish rulers gave to the southern region of Bosnia as a sign of respect for the local ruler Herzog. This title comes from Germanic word Herzog, which means Duke, and the local Herzogs fought so bravely for another 80 years after the rest of Bosnia surrendered to the Ottomans that even the Turks were in awe of their courage and um, paid their homage to them with the name Herzegovina. 
Another major European gap, of course, between the Muslim and Christians was open with their arrival in the late 14th century. They came fast and furious and within a century, the whole of the Balkans was conquered, except for Dubrovnik and the Venetian coast under Venice. Dubrovnik actually negotiated an annual freedom fee, uh, which wasn't 100% reliable, so they still kept maintaining those fortifications. Um, and uh, they also negotiated a duty-free trading in all Ottoman territories, which really annoyed Venetians. Four centuries, in some places even longer, of Ottoman presence has redefined everything in the Balkans, from politics and culture to general outlook on life. Uh, so we can enjoy the cultural inheritance now, you know, drinking our espressos very slowly and uh, grilling uh, our meat to perfections like the Ottomans. But in those times, fortifications were almost the only thing in our Balkan minds. As you can see here, this is a 16th century church on the island of uh, Hvar. And uh, this is a 15th century Serbian monastery, Manasia. And when you look at these places, the Holy Mass is not the first thing that uh, springs to mind. By the end of the 17th century, Turks were pushed back. On this map, you can see clearly that the border between Europe and the Ottomans was the actual border between Croatia and Bosnia, still there today. While that was good news for a relatively short term, it will have a catastrophic effect in the 20th century. After a series of losses, the joint kingdom of Hungary and Croatia asked for the Habsburg protection, accepting the rule of the Habsburg monarch. As a part of the Austrian military strategy, a military frontier was set on the borders with the Ottoman Empire, which were Croatian borders. These reddish patches uh, mark here where the Habsburg uh, military frontier was in, in those days. Uh, it had a mixed success until the arrival of Serbian warriors in the late 17th century. At that time, the late 17th century, the Habsburgs tried to recapture Croatian and Serbian territories from the Turks, but their success was short-lived and the local population uh, of southern Serbia and Kosovo was then invited uh, to into exile to the Habsburg monarchy. It was negotiated between the Habsburgs and the Ottomans, uh, which they accepted and they set off in large numbers. The Serbs refer to this event as the Great Migration and uh, many stories and legends are told about it. After this exodus, they never managed to permanently recover their majority in Kosovo. But it is important to stress that it was not just ethnic Serbs that fled in the Great Migration. Albanians who were Serbian nationals or well, Ottoman nationals after the conquest fled with them um, as it is shown in this painting uh, here by a great Serbian romantic painter, Pajo Jovanovic. These two men, the one right in, in, in front um, and this one leading the uh, horse of the Orthodox priest, uh, they can easily be identified as Kosovar Albanians because of their costume, specifically the, the trousers and this particular cap. Uh, because many Kosovar Albanians were Christians and fled together with the Serbs. And when they came to the Habsburg monarchy, they were offered Croatian land in the military zone that I showed earlier. Now, this made Croatian nobility angry as the land was simply taken from them by the Habsburg and also uh, made Croatian peasants angry because they also fought against the Turks and were still locked in the feudal system. But now they had to watch these newcomers being gifted land and freedom. Serbs uh, were obviously happy to receive the land and freedom, but uh, they also had to follow certain rules and their religion was not really respected by the Habsburgs. They were allowed to, to worship, but they were not allowed to build churches or make any outside marks, markings of their religion. So they had to worship in what looked from the outside a standard house. They didn't really like that. This is the map from the 1990s war um, and the light grey patches here 
uh, show the areas where the war actually erupted in 1991 and where the fighting was also at its worst. And if you look very carefully, you realize that these two patches are really these two patches. So um, it's, it's the same area that the Habsburgs cooked up 300 years before. Uh, these were also an extremely troubled area during the Second World War. So when, when the first problems actually bubbled up to the surface. So the 1990s were just an extension of unfinished business from the Second World War. So about a millennium after the Byzantines set of the Serb-Albanian feud in motion with the military zone in Kosovo, the Habsburgs did the same with the Serbs and Croats in Croatia with the typical diplomatic sensitivity the great powers seem to display no matter where and when and others are then left to deal with. And we finally find ourselves in a 20th century when in the uh, First World War, the Serbs and the Croats found themselves fighting on different sides of all these gaps that I've mentioned so far. Croatian and <clears throat> Bosnian one uh, being by uh, default the losing Habsburg side and the Serbian the winning one. For decades, the idea of Slavs have been uh, entertained by many different groups and it culminated with the formation of the Kingdom of Serbs, uh, Croats and Slovenes in the Treaty of Versailles. It looked like a happy ending, but it was far from it. During the Versailles negotiations, the Slavs from the ex-Habsburg areas did not want to join the Serbian Kingdom, fearing Serbian domination. They wanted to unite into one democratic republic. They were deemed too immature by the great powers, France and Britain, so it was negotiated that they would be a parliamentary monarchy with the King of Montenegro at its helm. Montenegro was a brand new kingdom, only nine years old at that point, and enjoyed a great popularity in Europe due to their uh, long heroic resistance against the Ottoman Empire. Even Tennyson uh, wrote poems about it. What happened is still hotly debated and researched. We are not entirely sure. Within weeks, the plan changed and the Serbs won. Somehow the Montenegrin king ended up uh, being prevented to return to the Balkans from Paris to be crowned as, as the new king of uh, many Slavs. And the Serbian king was crowned instead as a parliamentary monarch of this new kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes. This union was a very troubled one from the day one. Eventually the king dissolved the parliament and declared the absolute monarchy in the 1930s. So when the World War II started, the Allies versus the Axis battle was just one of the things that kept people occupied. Different Yugoslav territories were annexed by four states. So we had Germans, Italian, Hungarians and Bulgarian governments. And then there were also uh, a puppet governments like independent state of Croatia under Germany really. But that was really the least of our problems. Parallel with fighting the Nazis, a full-blown multi-site civil war was raging for five years with at least five or six sides engaged at any given times in fighting over different causes. And all of that was swept under the carpet when Tito announced the victory of socialist brotherhood and unity, which is what most of people associate that with. He tried to be all-inclusive, uh, well, as long as, as you were a socialist and, uh, and didn't have um, any nationalism behind you. So he declared uh, four official languages, Serbo-Croatian and Croato-Serbian. They differ like American English and English English, and they use different scripts, Latin and Cyrillic. And uh, we also had Slovene and Macedonian, which uh, are somewhat different. And the uh, Serbs, Croats, Montenegrins, Bosnians, Herzegovinians, uh, we can all understand each other without a problem. But with Slovenes and Macedonians, uh, we prefer to have subtitles when we watch their movies. Uh, there were, uh, he also granted the Muslims the right to declare Islam as ethnicity and not religion. So they weren't forced to declare themselves Serbs or Croats in, in Bosnia simply because of the language. Um, 
and he gave minorities protection and support. So that's how we got uh, Vojvodina with Hungarians and Kosovo with Albanians. Um, so for a while, the majority believed in this idea of brotherhood and unity, but the problem was that the ghosts of the past were never dealt with. Um, and as always, they resurfaced when the Western loans dried out after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And uh, we were no longer needed as a buffer between the disintegrating Eastern Bloc and Western Europe. The socialist economy collapsed completely and the uh, regional politicians started the blame game using the old ghosts as it suited them. And the rest you saw on the news uh, in the 1990s. So I want to finish with this tormented sculpture uh, of Job uh, by the Yugoslav Croatian artist Ivan Meštrović. His silent scream sums up the anguish of past and present, the constant and consistent push and pull of East, West and uh, North and South divisions, which for the peoples of the gap, my people, are not a distant uh, history. This uh, balancing in between is, is it's really how we live. It's, it's part of our DNA. It's, uh, it's our collective memory. Uh, really. And uh, unfortunately, it isn't actually so well known. It isn't comparatively taught to all those afflicted. So it can still be used by various politicians and various foreign powers to divide and rule. I think it's only appropriate that this divide and rule uh, motto came from Philip of Macedon, appropriately a guy from the, from the Balkans. <clears throat> so the Balkanization continues. Um, and uh, we continue along with it. Thank you very much. I will be uh, most pleased to take your questions. Hvala, thank you for listening. Okay, Nirvana, thank you very much for that. We've, we've had a few questions, as you can imagine. Um, and we had a few questions before you started as well. Um, can I pose one question, which I think sounds particularly interesting. Uh, does Nirvana anticipate more Balkan states will fracture into smaller ones in the future? Well, the, the, the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina remains unresolved. The, the Dayton agreement was really something that was again done very in a very rushed manner. I, I suppose they just wanted to stop the slaughter and they achieved that. So, so you know, that was a good that was a good outcome, um, but uh, it didn't really resolve. It didn't resolve the dispute. So Bosnia and Herzegovina, which to the outside world uh, appears as a one country, is effectively three countries in one. Nobody really cooperates. The unemployment rages from fifty to seventy percent, depending on the region. It's a um, paradise of smugglers and, and organized crime and so on. And, you know, Serbs are sitting in their, in their enclaves. Croats are sitting in Herzegovina. <laughs> the Bosniaks are, are trying. The Bosniaks are, are, who, who were not uh, really a Muslim extremist to start with, uh, because of being shunned due to their faith, have now uh, accepted a lot of uh, um, a lot of support from the um, uh, um, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, and you know you can just imagine the the you know where the story leads. So although there is a peace there because they're simply too poor and exhausted to go and fight, um, but uh, it's it's it it's a it's a completely completely dysfunctional as as a as, an, as a country, as a state, as a unit. So I don't know how that's going to be resolved. So the, the answer is, is up ticking. in the air on that one. Yeah, yeah. The rest is ticking. The rest is ticking. It's, okay. It's, it has uh, a another question we've had is how badly has the archaeology fared as a result of recent Balkan wars and other military activity? Who, what is trying to re remedy that, if anybody? Um, well, I depends depends where you're looking but for example in Croatia not too bad um, not too bad at all uh, actually where where it suffered uh, 
was actually Kosovo because the um, angry as you can imagine, the Kosovars just wanted to to erase the presence of the Serb off of the <laughs> off of the the Kosovar ground. So there's been a lot of destruction there. Uh, but it, it is it there the the luckily the main things were actually preserved so that's that's a good thing it is being restored slowly with the help of unesco and uh, various uh, um uh, various uh, uh, foreign interventions the 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 problem is not so much a destruction it is historical neglect because you know, up until the 20th century, we had all these foreign powers who clearly weren't interested in, in you know, our cultural inheritance and so on. But uh, in, the, in, in the 20th century, during Tito's uh, era, it, you know, it wasn't really a good thing for your career to go and uh, research anything that had to do with the church. And almost, you know, most of the histories, either religious fresco, religious icons, churches, kings. So... Kings were not allowed, nobility was not allowed, religion was not popular. So it, things were not researched. Um, and similarly, Illyrians were completely neglected, especially in Albania. So in Albania, there are some fantastic sites that are simply neglected or not researched at all, none whatsoever. So um, it, it, it needs work, it needs work. But in terms of destruction, not too bad. Not too bad, okay. Um, we have another question. Did the Mongols have any impact or did they skirt it as too mountainous? <laughs> no, they did come, they did come, but, <laughs> but, but they didn't stay because uh, again, the, the, you know, you actually can't organize a sustainable supply chain through those mountains. So they came in few outbursts and th then they stir they went they went towards Italy more, uh, but they didn't uh, um, we, we don't we don't consider them as a major major scourge, but they were there. They were there. OK. Um, another question. I once heard refer to the 600 year Ottoman period as an interlude. <laughs> well, for 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 Serbs and Kosovars, that was an interlude, you know, because the the when the when the Ottomans arrived in in Kosovo, which was uh, um, sort of late, very late 14th century, by that point, Serbs and, and Albanians were were fighting there for uh, what seven centuries. Um, you know, uh, so they had they had a relative period of truce even because in they, they fought the Turks together and even especially when you look at Albania, the 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 first proper political organization in Albania was a League of Leisure organized by the Skanderbeg in in 15th century and and the, I would say about 40 percent of the League of Leisure were Serb were Serbian clans. Uh, you know, so it was an interlude, you know, for, for some of us, it was an interlude. Um, and also for Croats, it was certainly an interlude because we lost our glorious early medieval kingdom and we were hoping, we were hoping to get, you know, the hands up above the uh, Hungarians again. And then, you know, then the Turks came. So we had to, we had to deal with the Turks together, actually, uh, before we could get back to, you know, seeking our own independence. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> okay, one final question, because I'm conscious of time, and, and we've been nearly an hour, so I, I think this will be the final question. But here's the question. Wasn't it both the Serbs and the Croats who received the Byzantine invitation? Does that make sense? <laughs> Uh, the, 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 Ser if we're talking about Kosovo, it was Serbs only because it was negotiated with the settlement from Thessaloniki and Croats certainly were not on that side at all. When they moved, they moved directly into the area of today's Croatia and, and the Western Bosnia. So if we're talking about Kosovo, no. Uh, but if we are talking about the uh, Croatian coastal land, when they arrived and the early duchies were certainly accepted the, the, the Byzantine rule and the Byzantines accepted them and because they asked them to help 
fight against the various other barbarians that were coming. Let's not get too complicated, Avars and, and Goths and, and, and Huns and so on. So yes, it was both, but at different, different parts of the empire. Okay. I think, Nirvana, that, that probably answers all the questions we have time for today. Um, I think there may still be some unanswered questions, and we'll try and respond to those by email. Um, and if anyone has more questions, then please do email us. Um, if anyone's interested in joining uh, Nirvana's uh, journey to Macedonia, then you, by all means, please contact Distant Horizons. Hopefully the, the, the contact information is there, our website and our email address. And then we will send you an in-depth itinerary of Nirvana's trip to, to Macedonia um, and parts of Southeast Albania. Uh, and, and by all means, please contact us about that. I, I would just like to end today by giving a big thank you to Nirvana for giving such a, a wonderfully clear and, and, and cogent uh, explanation of Balkan history in what's <laughs> a very complex subject. Um, and I'm sure it probably will throw up more questions than it shows up answers, but that I suspect is the nature of the region. Anyway, a huge thank you to Nirvana and, and thank you too for everyone for, for tuning in today. Thank you very much indeed and, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.